C. That no one misleads you. The Bible is clear that the last days will be filled with false teachers, deception, mockers, lawlessness, those who love themselves, those who will be unloving and unholy, those without self-control, those who will pretend to know God, yet they are simply whitewashed tombs. There will be no great end times revival, just a great last days deception. Scripture warns that people will creep into their churches unaware. Who are those creeping in and why are they doing it? The church in the last days will be full of compromise, deception, and a lack of discernment. Life clips will contend earnestly for the faith as Jude 3 instructs. Warning, the red light has been turned on. Grab your Bible. It's time to expose the dark. Sometimes people make it sound like the Catholic understanding of how to get to heaven is really complex. It's not. Well, you can go into any of Christ's teachings in a lot of very rich detail. He made sure that this one could be understood even by a child. I can summarize it in two sentences. To come to God and be saved, you need to repent, have faith, and be baptized. If you commit mortal sin, you need to repent, have faith, and go to confession. Boy, have you lost your mind, because I'll help you find it. That's it. That's all there is to it. Today we're going to celebrate, and I do mean celebrate, the table of the Lord, the incredible privilege of sharing in the body and the blood of Jesus. I admire some of our friends from other streams in the body of Christ, the Catholics are probably the best at this, and Episcopalian and some of the others. They have such a higher view of communion than does the Protestant church and Pentecostal circles, our stream. Um, they have such a high view of this moment that I think we could learn from them. I, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're going to read through the most familiar passage on the subject, and rightly so, because this is where Paul kind of unwraps his insight into the subject that he says Jesus himself gave him. And uh, we're going to look at that, and then I'm going to just, I, I want to just take you through my own, my own journey, what I do when I take communion. I try to take it every day. I don't always succeed. I don't want to give that picture, but have you, if you've been to the prayer house, you see the little communion cups that we have over there, and then they have a little wafer, a little unleavened bread wafer on top of it, and they're separated by a, 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 a membrane, and you peel that off and eat the bread and take the cup. I, I, we have box, two boxes of those at home, and, and Benny takes some with her. I take them when I travel. I usually take a pile of them so that I have them available for me. <laughs> I don't know why this messed me up. I... I I like to take communion every day, and I, I have a certain process that I go through. I like to take time. When we do it corporately, we've got just a few minutes, and understandably, we're not able to go through all the things I'd like to see us go through. But today, we're going to take just a hair more time. We're going to do it at the end of the meeting today. But I want to talk to you about my, my process, what I do when I take communion. I, I don't like to rush through it. I like to take time with the Lord, because he, he declared something about this event. He said, in, in communion, you are proclaiming, shouting, if you will, the Lord's death until he comes. Think about this. The Lord's death until he comes. His death was the payment for your salvation. When he comes, your salvation is complete. The scripture teaches that when you're born again, you're saved. But then the scripture also says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So there's another truth laid on top of that. That's that not only were you saved, you're being saved. But then the Bible also teaches when he returns, you will be saved. And so this meal is a tool of celebration for us, a tool of honor that has military effects on the circumstances of our life. I don't accept that. God's sovereignty is a realm in the Bible that many cannot understand because we look at things through the lens of our human eyes. 
However, this particular, I don't even want to call him a pastor, gentleman has zero clue of who and what God is. So I am not here to debate what you think of God's sovereignty, of our free will and our choice. You need to work that out. However, what I am here to tell you is that this gentleman is putting God below us. Meaning, we make God choose. So we're alternating his eternal plan. Remember, God has foreknowledge. He is already at the end of time. He's not readjusting his schematics, his plans, his agenda, because he's not sitting back saying, oh, wait, wait, oh, hold on. Wait, wait, Jesus. Wait, guys, we need to come together here because Kim literally just chose this instead of that. So now we have to rearrange everything. That, my friends, is not the biblical God. He doesn't push the pause button because we didn't choose what he thought we were going to choose. He has foreknowledge. He knows exactly what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, thus laying out the plans from before time began until, I don't even want to say until time ends because it's eternal. God's sovereign. He doesn't need us to help him decide anything. God says, you've got a choice here. You can go my way, and my way is the way of life. Because I designed this thing, and I kind of know how it runs best. If you go according to my plan, it's going to look really well for you. But if you decide to go your own way, and you're free to do that, then that will lead to death. You can tell yourself it won't lead to death. You can tell yourself it will lead to prosperity. You can tell yourself all the lies you want, but it's going to lead to death. It's clear that God wants us to choose life because he loves us. And he knows that all sin brings about destruction. It's, it, destruction is inherent in sin. And so he's saying, no, go according to my way and live and thrive. But we are free to choose death. And when we choose death, it breaks God's heart. And in, in the end, it breaks our heart. And it hurts other people, harm all the way around. But God will not coerce us into making that decision because he made us free. In fact, and here you have to put on your philosophical caps now. Your thinking caps, follow this. If God makes us free, God cannot coerce us. By definition. So think about free will this way. Free will is your say-so. You can have a say in what comes to pass. God empowers us to have say-so. Which means God, God no longer has all the say-so. What? He gives some of it to us. So my, my free will is my ability to go this way to this degree and have this effect on the world, or to go that way to that degree and have that effect on the world. And let's say that way is the bad way, a destructive way. I, I can go this way or that way. That's my free will. It's up to me to decide that. But now if God were to revoke that from me, take that one away, because he doesn't like that choice, then God clearly didn't give me the ability to go this way to this degree or that way to that degree. If God gives me the ability to go this way or that way, God's got to let me go that way, because that's what it means to give me the ability to go that way. <laughs> you follow on this? So by definition, free will, I told you to put your think caps on, think philosophically. By definition, it's irrevocable. God can't coerce a free agent for the same reason God can't make a round triangle or a married bachelor or an honest politician. It's just, it's not going to happen. It's a contradiction in terms. Sorry about that. If you're a politician, I apologize. Just having a little fun. So, so, so it, it's irrevocable. And that means then, if God's going to create this kind of a world with free agents, there are going to be some things that constrain God. We all believe it, baby. Honestly, right. we all believe it because we want to believe it. Which leads to my second point. It means that God doesn't always get his way. If my answers frighten you, then you should cease asking scary questions. God doesn't always get his way. Isaiah 30 says this. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord. Children of Israel here. Who carry out a plan, but it's not mine. Who make an alliance, but against my will. Adding sin to sin. You guys are carrying out a plan, but it's not my plan. You're carrying out your will, but it's not my will. And that's the very definition of sin. Sin is going against the will of God. 
Um, and so if, if, if we carry out our own plans and, and they're sinful because they're contrary to God's plans, that entails, does it not, that not everything that happens is part of God's plan. There's other plans at work. There's other thinking at work. And so what happens in this world is not just a result of what God wants. It's a result of what God wants combined with what all these other beings want. Well, they telling you lies. We all have some say in what comes to pass and we can use it for better or for worse. And when we make those choices, the explanation for it and the responsibility for it lands on us, not God. What did you say? And when we make those choices, the explanation for it and the responsibility for it lands on us, not God. So, so suppose I decide, being of sound mind and, and having free will, Suppose I choose to throw this pen at Mary. Whoa, look at me! <laughs> now, suppose it stuck her in the eye. You know, she's blinded in one eye. It would make sense if I did that, because I did do that, to ask me, Greg, why did you choose to throw the pen at Mary? That makes sense. And I'd try to give you an explanation. And I'm responsible for whatever harm happened to Mary, wouldn't I be? So, so if I blind you, sue me, don't sue God. See, it would make sense to ask Greg, why did you do this? But it what doesn't make sense to say, hmm, why did God do that? Or why did God plan this? What was God's purpose in having Greg throw the pen at Mary? Because God didn't throw the pen at Mary, I did. And so the buck stops with me. Now, maybe the responsibility is partly shared by my parents who did, you know, screwed me up as a child and you know, there's other factors that, that contributed to it but I'm the primary one who bears responsibility for it. And so, so we must not be blaming God for things that people and other agents choose to do. It doesn't work like that. So if we accept this, then we can understand how this world is a world where God doesn't always get his way, where God has to allow people's choices and their ripple effects to be carried out. Now God can influence all around that and God can raise up other people to, to circumvent that but God will not intervene and coerce people to make the right choices because by definition, he already gave them that choice. There's a restriction that's put on God the minute he decides to create this kind of world as opposed to a world where he would be controlling everything. He could have created that world where everything is going just as he wants because he's controlling everything. But that would be a world that is devoid of personality, a world that's devoid of moral responsibility, and a world that's incapable of love. And love is the point of the whole thing. Somebody say amen. You already know if I'm going to take it. Wouldn't be much of an oracle if I didn't. But if you already know, how can I make a choice? Because you didn't come here to make the choice. You've already made it. You're here to try to understand why you made it.